flames after a deadly attack. Rescue crews try to extinguish a fire burning in an airport in Ukraine. Hours after officials there claim Russia sent in rockets killing nine people, including civilians and military personnel. At least 15 people have been rescued from the rubble as black smoke continues to pour into the sky. Wishful thinking? A new promise of a ceasefire from the Kremlin tonight as Ukrainians are forced from their homes by the tens of thousands. It comes with a potentially dangerous catch. The latest talks between Ukraine and Russia and the new intensified demands from Ukraine, hoping the rest of the world takes a drastic measure. Children put on trains without their parents on the tracks, hopefully to safety. Tonight, the latest in the massive refugee crisis, as more than 1.7 million refugees flee Ukraine, many of them young and afraid. One on one with the president of Ukraine, World News anchor David Muir talks exclusively with President Vladimir Zelensky, his vow to stay in his country's capital until the very end, his response to Russia's demands in order to end the war, and the message for the American people. A family's plea to President Biden. Their message to the White House as a former Marine sits in a Russian detention center. They say he is sick and waiting for help. We're desperate. He's the only man in the world that can bring our son home and possibly save his life. Cryptocurrency now emerging as a chess piece in the war in Ukraine. How the emerging market is becoming a focal point in Ukraine's request for more sanctions against Russia. We're watching history being made in real time here. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight in Ukraine, day 12 of war and unrest. And tonight, President Zelensky is telling the world, we're used to saying Monday is a hard day, but the country is at war now, so every day is Monday. And the reality tonight is every day in Ukraine is increasingly filled with more destruction and death for Ukrainians still trying to get away from a war they did not ask for. And it's becoming clear Russia is targeting those civilians as tens of thousands are now trying to flee to safety. Efforts to establish a humanitarian corridor to allow them to escape have failed now for three days straight. Families like this one running from the shelling as mortars fall and homes burn in the city of Irpin, just north of Kyiv. For many, the escape route from the capital is across this down bridge. People fleeing, exposing themselves to attack. Tonight, President Zelensky is out with a new video statement telling all Ukrainians who've stayed behind to fight, we're not scared because you're not scared. Ian Panel leads us off once again tonight from Kyiv and a warning that some viewers may find the images you're about to see in Ian's piece disturbing. Tonight, across Ukraine, civilians are being driven from their homes by the tens of thousands. After efforts to establish temporary ceasefires were repeatedly broken by Russia, the Kremlin now claiming another one will come into force tomorrow in a number of cities. A previous corridor offered by Russia only allowing safe passage onto its own territory and that of its ally Belarus, which Ukraine calls unacceptable. So far, Russia's ceasefires set up for people to leave have been nothing of the sort. Morning. In Irpin, about 16 miles northwest of Kyiv, terrifying video shows civilians trying to escape when a mortar shell explodes. Soldiers bravely risking their own lives to give first aid. It was too late. Stay there! At least eight people were killed, including at least three members of the same family. Oh, at least 5,000 people have fled, many of them under fire, having to run for their lives with what little they can carry after almost a week of intense fighting in the city. Leader. As the shells landed, trying to take cover, then having to navigate a blown-up bridge to run to safer ground. We're hearing the sound of fairly regular bombardment. We're close to the front lines. It's just down that road. The town of Irpin is being brutally shelled by Russian forces. Hundreds, thousands of civilians are desperately trying to get out of the town, but they've also come under fire. Some of them have been killed today, just trying to get out and get safe. Tatiana Bogatova is a pediatrician from the town. She had to run for miles through the night to escape with 18-month-old Vavara. The Russians were there in their tanks, she says. They fired mortar shells into people's yards. I couldn't stay there with a child. Across the country, Russia's stepping up its attacks, laying siege to some cities that are now cut off without power or heating. Ukraine's armed forces sharing a video of what they say is a downed Russian jet crashing. 
Meanwhile, a third round of ceasefire talks was held in Belarus today. Ukraine says small positive movements were made in trying to establish these humanitarian corridors. The Kremlin claims that it could stop the attacks at any moment, but only if Ukraine promises to never join NATO, to recognize Crimea as Russian, and accept the independence of Russian controlled parts of eastern Ukraine. All have been non starters for Ukraine. President Biden talked with European leaders today who vowed to continue raising the costs on Russia amid discussions about possibly cutting off all Russian oil and gas imports. Also, the Pentagon revealing today it ordered an additional 500 U.S. troops to deploy to Europe over the weekend. We're joined now by Ian Panel in Kyiv. And Ian, I imagine there has been no indication you've seen that the temporary ceasefire Russia claims will begin tomorrow will be any different than failed attempts in the past few days? No, I think we're right to be sceptical, and that's certainly the view from the ground. I mean, don't forget that there was, uh, again, one of these temporary ceasefires, one of these uh, supposed humanitarian corridors established um, in Mariupol over the weekend. Almost immediately, the ceasefire was breached by Russian forces, and civilians came under attack. And here's the other problem with uh, the corridors that are now being proposed by Russia. They say there's going to be ceasefires um, on Tuesday morning here, is that they're saying that the passage, the safe passage, it doesn't lead into Ukraine, uh, to the West. It doesn't lead towards Poland and Europe. It leads directly either into Russia or into Belarus, which, of course, is Russia's ally. So just imagine you, you're, you're leaving your home because you've been under bombardment, you're, you're running for your lives, and the Russians are expecting people to run into their arms. I mean, apart from the cynicism of that, the Ukrainian government saying that that is clearly unacceptable. And, Ian, you also had the chance to visit Irpin this weekend, one of those towns close to Kyiv that has just been devastated. What struck you the most about what you saw there? Uh, you know what really shocked me the most is the last time I saw people look like that, look that scared, look that bedraggled, uh, people who'd, who'd gone to extraordinary lengths to just escape for their lives was in Mosul, in Iraq. Uh, when the battle was on to try and take the city from ISIS. And, and it was the same look in people's eyes, that sheer terror that they've literally been to hell and back. Uh, and even when they get out, they don't know where is safe, they don't know where they're going to go. Yeah, there was one uh, young mum, which is featured in our report, and she's a paediatrician in this town. Um, uh, you know, she has this 18-month-old toddler. And for anyone out there with kids, you know, you know how difficult it is just to keep toddlers uh, minded and safe inside your own home. She had to run through the night with a group of people passing a toddler from person to person through the night just to reach the edge of Irpin. Uh, and that's what so many people are going through right now. And for every person who gets out, there are many more who are left behind, unable to get out now because they're surrounded by the fighting and of course they get caught in the crossfires. What we see repeatedly in conflicts, civilians always, always paying the greatest price for something they didn't start and they can't control and often can't escape from. Right. Lindsay? Ian Panel reporting in from Kiev for us once again. Thanks so much, Ian. And as the crisis escalates, the stream of humanity fleeing the war zone continues to grow. Now 1.7 million people have left Ukraine for neighboring countries, some of them children, orphaned due to this horror. Matt Gutman picks up that part of the story for us. Through those colorful gates, on the other side of that bomb shelter, the squeal of kids on a merry-go-round. But this isn't a school, it's a state-run orphanage. And half the children here have fled besieged cities in eastern Ukraine in desperate need of shelter, hot meals, and the nourishment of affection. They don't know what war is, we're told here, but they know that something is wrong. They know they're not where they used to be. Many kids, like the ones behind me, are from the war-torn region of Lugansk. Volunteers offer enrichment, coloring with them, building blocks, a few quiet minutes watching Paw Patrol. Even in Lviv, there are nightly reminders of the war. Every night when we hear the sirens, do they get terrified? She tells me it was horrible the first day the kids arrived. Every child was shouting and screaming. Their trauma expressed in flashes of anger. 
and bursts of tears. I mean, this yes. seems like there's a lot of aggression. A lot, a lot of, of aggression. Anger. Yes, anger. Before the war, Anna was a political science major. These days, she specializes in the chemistry of cuddles. What do they need most? I think just time spending, like being with them, is the most important. Lindsay, the head of that orphanage, telling us that she doesn't have any plans to move these kids again. They've been through too much. What they need now is stability. She said if the Russians begin shelling, their plan is just to hunker down in that bomb shelter. Lindsay. Yeah, they have already been through so much. Matt, our thanks to you. And as the battle tonight for Ukraine goes on for the first time, President Zelensky appeared in his office in the Capitol, saying in a new video from his desk, we're not scared because you're not scared. But earlier, he had so much more to tell World News Tonight anchor David Muir, who spoke exclusively with him with the help of a Ukrainian government translator. Mr. President, thank you so much for joining us. We're aware of the situation around Kyiv right now, the fighting to the north, uh, the fighting to the west. What is the situation right now on the ground there, and, and how long do you think you can keep the capital of Kyiv? We are being bombarded not only in the city of Kyiv, um, not only in the housing sectors, but also in the suburbs of Kyiv. You can't even recognize um, the way our capital looks right now. The city of Kharkiv, Vinitsa, Odessa, Shutomer, Chernihiv, Mariupol, many cities are being bombed. I know you're aware of the reality on the ground when you list all of those cities where there is Russian bombardment right now, the Russians closing in. Uh, the Pentagon, uh, of course, here in the U.S., believes that about 95 percent of Russian troops that have been amassed along the Ukrainian border are now inside Ukraine. That would be nearly 150,000 troops. How long can the Ukrainian military, the Ukrainian people, hold off the Russians? I'm sure that Ukrainians are prepared uh, to stand against Russia f for their entire lives. Even the cities that were occupied by a Russian military, they have seen the response and feedback from ordinary people. These ordinary people didn't have machine guns. This courage is something that is unprecedented, and Russian soldiers don't even have uh, that courage. The problem is that for one soldier of Ukraine, we have 10 Russian soldiers, and for one Ukrainian tank, we have 50 Russian tanks, but we are destroying them, and this difference is that the gap is closing. But the question is, how long can we withstand? Many things depend not just on us. We will endure, and even if they come into all our cities, there will be insurgency, insurgent war, and no one will give away our independence. Today, war is here. Tomorrow, it will be in Lithuania, then in Poland, then in Germany. This is serious. United States is far away, but in recent days, I do feel that United States are closer to us. I know you spoke with President Biden again. I'm curious, what's the most important thing you're asking the president for, asking the U.S. for right now? I told him that for us, the most important today is the security in the sky. We cannot uh, allow Russia to be active there only because they're bombing us, they are shelling us, they are bombing us, they are sending m missiles, helicopters, jet fighters. So a lot of things, uh, but we are not doing this because we don't have the sky. We don't control our sky. The president and NATO have said no to this no-fly zone because of concerns this could trigger a much wider a conflict, a much a bigger war than what we're seeing uh, already because there would have to be a willingness to shoot Russian planes out of the sky. Do you understand that concern? What do you mean to shoot down Russian planes? If the missile is flying, yesterday, for example, the missile hit the university in the city of Kharkiv and the dormitory, and the same uh, missile uh, hit the tumor uh, pediatric clinic um, in Kyiv. So if this missile is flying, so are you thinking whether to shoot it down or not? I think there is no any other answer but to yes, yes, 
they sh need to be shot down. You have to preserve, preserve lives. I'm sure that the brave uh, American soldiers who would be shooting it down, knowing that it is flying towards the students, I'm sure that they had no doubt in doing so. Mr. President, I know that no one questions the horror unfolding in Ukraine right now. What the president has said here, uh, and lawmakers really in both parties, Republicans and Democrats, have stood behind the president on this, the concern about uh, protecting and enforcing a no-fly zone over Ukraine would then lead to the possibility it would draw the U.S. into a wider war with Russia, that they're simply not willing to do that. We are a place in Europe a place of freedom, a zone of freedom. And uh, um, everyone thinks that we are far away from America or Canada. Uh, no, we are this zone of freedom. And when the limits of uh, rights and freedoms are being violated and stepped on, then you have to protect us because we will come first, you will come second, because the more this beast will eat, he wants more, more and more. Mr. President, you talked about the need for fighter jets. We know the U.S. is uh, reportedly looking at how to supply Russian uh, jets from Poland. Uh, you, had, you had requested these jets because Ukrainian fighter pilots know how to fly these Russian planes. Has there been any movement on that front? We asked not only the United States, we asked many other countries. I'm not going to name them. We looked into this question. We know where these Soviet planes are stationed, which countries host them, and we asked these countries. And in many ways, it is the United States, in many ways, who will decide. Do you believe the president could be doing more to help? I'm sure that the president can do more. I'm sure he can, and I would like to believe that, that he's capable of doing that. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, said just in the last uh, 24 hours that the U.S. is looking uh, at credible reports that civilians have been intentionally targeted there uh, in Ukraine, saying if so, it would be a war crime. We, of course, have seen these horrific images uh, in these last few hours. Do you believe that Putin is deliberately attacking civilians? Why, why would I care? The result is the same. People are dying. The bombardment of the schools and kindergartens, the universities, the dormitory, the bombardment of uh, a nuclear power plant, without even thinking that Europe may disappear if it really hits the unit. Every minute, every hour, every day, the same things are happening. People are dying. Do you believe Putin is a war criminal? I think that all people who came to our land, all people who gave those orders, all uh, soldiers who were shooting, they're all war criminals. Let me ask you, Mr. President, it's believed the U.S. and the West have offered help to get you out of that country alive if it comes to that. Have they made that offer, and how long will you stay? Yes, I was offered because there was a loss of information and uh, several special, uh, special groups who were sent to uh, kill me and uh, my family. I said no, because how can I do this? I'm the citizen of my uh, country, and uh, I'm the um, elected president of these people. So you will stay until the end, no matter what that means? Well, I would like the end to be like in the Hollywood movies, the happy end for our country. What would you like to say to Vladimir Putin right now? I think he is capable of stopping the war that he started. And even if he doesn't think that he was the one who started, he should know one important thing, a thing that uh, cannot uh, deny that stopping the war is what he's capable of. For the American people and for the people of the West who have been moved by your resilience and by the bravery of the Ukrainian people, do you have a message for them? Uh, I, I don't know what to say. Thank you very much. You know, you know, what to say to Americans? 
I, ju I just want you to feel and to understand what does it mean for us freedom. Because always American people, uh, they speak about freedom and they, and, and they know what is it. And now when you are looking at Ukrainians, I think you feel what does it mean for us. So we are not far from you. We are not far from you. And that's why Americans, if you see, and if you understand how we feel life, how we fight against all the enemies for our freedom, support us, support us. And not only with words, with concrete, direct steps, do it. And you, and I think, I think we'll, we'll, we'll win. Of course, together with all the, with all the world. President Zelensky remaining optimistic. Our thanks to David Muir for bringing us that. And joining us now is former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, William Taylor. Ambassador Taylor, thanks so much for joining us again. You just heard that conversation between David Muir and President Zelensky. President Zelensky talked about how important a no-fly zone over Ukraine would be. Why does he keep pushing for the no-fly zone when the U.S. and NATO have repeatedly denied it? He wants to be sure that we understand how badly the Russians are targeting and how clearly the Russians are targeting people in his country. Um, this is tearing him apart, that, uh, that civilians, Ukrainians, his citizens are being killed. I have had conversations with, with many Ukrainians, including senior members of the opposition that used to be the opposition, now totally united behind President Zelensky. So, so this is felt across the board. He is, he is reflecting the, the anguish um, that, uh, that they feel. That said, he is also proud of the work that his Air Force is doing. His Air Force is taking airplanes, Russian airplanes, out of the sky. But it's limited. It's difficult for him to continue to do that. So that's why he needs to be sure that we understand the, the danger that his, his people are in and that we understand the importance of, for example, those fighter jets that uh, we're hoping get, the Soviet fighter jets that can, can come from East Europe. It's that kind of work that we need to do. And the Kremlin says that there are three conditions to ending the war. Ukraine must give up on joining NATO, recognize Crimea as part of Russia, and recognize the independence of the two separatist regions in the east. President Zelensky says that they may have a solution for these demands. What might that look like? First of all, Lindsay, it's very important that the president and that Ukraine have a solution to these issues. No one should be able, no one can impose their will and take sovereignty from Ukraine. Ukraine's sovereign. That means it gets to decide. President Zelensky gets to decide on how to respond to these. So on NATO, he has, he has made it very clear. In fact, is the Ukrainian constitution, Lindsay, has NATO and the European Union in it as the direction of where they want to end up. So President Zelensky knows where he wants to go. He knows that it's a security arrangement that he is after. There may be, there may be, there are lots of ways to, be, to have a security agreement or, or, or offense with, with other, other apps. There, there are ways to move forward on that, that may or may not have NATO in it. So he may have some ideas, but the key point is it's a Ukrainian decision. It's a Ukrainian decision on that. On the other two, on the business about recognizing Crimea and recognizing Donbass um, as independent nations, no Ukrainian wants to do that. No Ukrainian will do that. They recognize sovereignty over all of their territory. And Donbass and Crimea are part of that territory. There may be ways to think about that. There may be ways to deal with that over time. But I think in the end, he will not recognize it. We never recognized it, Lindsay. We didn't recognize when the Soviet Union went into the Baltic states. And we didn't, we have said the same thing. We're not going to recognize when the Russians go into Crimea. But again, this is a decision for Ukrainians to make. They are sovereign. They get to decide. And more sanctions are now in place against Russia and President Putin. And more Ukrainians are armed and ready to fight. What does an off-ramp for Putin potentially look like to avoid him from escalating this even further? So he might be able to listen to other international leaders. He might be able to listen to President Macron. He might be able to listen to the Israeli prime minister. He might be able to listen to 
President Xi in, in uh, China. What he knows is the world is united against him. The, what he knows is he has lost all credibility. He is, he is the only one who is responsible for this war. And he knows that, you talked about criminality, that he knows that that's there. So he needs to find a way out and he can call it, he can call a ceasefire. The first thing that needs to happen, Lindsay, is a ceasefire so that Ukrainians are not being killed, so his own soldiers are not being killed. That's the first thing they can do. And then there will be discussions with the Ukrainians and he can negotiate as well as he can. Um, and that is the method. First a ceasefire and then a sit down probably with, with President Zelensky, but certainly with their officials below that in preparation for that kind of a discussion. And really quickly before I let you go, how likely do you think that that ceasefire would be? Lindsay, I think there's a good chance for a ceasefire. Um, we've had some conversations, as you have you recognized, uh, between Ukrainians and and uh, and Russians on the Belarusian border. Part of that conversation, I'm told, has to do with a ceasefire. That could help. There might be ceasefires, temporary ceasefires, uh, for humanitarian corridors. So that's a step. Certainly, a ceasefire for for individual places could be a possibility. Ambassador Taylor, always glad to have you on the show. Thank you, Lindsay. ABC News Chief White House Correspondent Cecilia Vega joins us now. Cecilia, we heard President Zelensky earlier saying President Biden can do more to facilitate getting those Polish fighter jets to Ukraine. You asked the White House about that today. What was the response? Yeah, Lindsay, uh, tonight the White House is really facing a lot of pressure right now to push Poland even further uh, to deliver these planes to Ukraine. These are conversations that are still ongoing. In return, uh, if Poland decides to do this, the U.S. would then deliver fighter jets to Poland. The reality is, the press secretary press secretary told me today this is an extremely complicated scenario we're talking about think of these two to two things here uh, the logistics alone of delivering planes in a war zone that is no easy feat and then this issue of these planes Soviet planes landing in Poland taking off in Poland fighting a war in Ukraine certainly would be viewed by Russia as an escalatory move in this crisis Putin has said as much that that he would view this uh, as a threat certainly the White House says look we're not a Opposed to Poland delivering these planes. It's really up to Poland whether they want to make this decision or not. And right now, Lindsay, the reality is Poland is saying this is not something they're going to do. They will assist Ukraine as much as possible, but namely we're talking about that humanitarian aid that we've all been witnessing. So complex, as you said. Cecilia Vega reporting in from the White House. Thanks so much, as always, Cecilia. And when we come back, the deadly tornado is killing at least seven in the south. One confirmed as a powerful EF4 as our weather team tracks a strong line of storms moving east. We examine the role cryptocurrencies may be playing in the war in Ukraine and why one side appears to be benefiting more than the other. But up next, the concerns grow for Brittany Griner, the WNBA superstar detained by Russia, as we speak with the parents of a Marine who says that he was arrested in Russia on trumped-up charges and they are now desperate for his release. Coming up next. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17 year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby! 
ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva, drama, money and fame, shot amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Next to the concerns over the safety of WNBA superstar Brittany Griner. She's been detained in Russia on drug charges amid the rising tensions between the U.S. and Russia. James Longman has more. Seven-time WNBA All-Star and two-time Olympic gold medalist Brittany Griner is in Russian custody. Video released by Russian Customs appears to show the 31-year-old athlete going through airport security near Moscow last month, and the video then shows an employee removing a package from her bag. Russian state media reports vape cartridges containing hashish oil found. Griner was arrested for allegedly smuggling a narcotic substance, an offence punishable there by up to 10 years in prison. The disturbing elements of this is the fact that Brittany can be held for years. They will keep her in jail as long as they like and as long as they find it useful for them. The Phoenix Mercury star has played in Russia for the last seven years during the off-season, most recently with UMMC Ekaterinburg, earning over a million dollars per season, more than quadruple her WNBA salary. It's unclear exactly when in February she was detained. Her last Instagram post dated February 5th. Her agent saying they can confirm that as we work to get her home, her mental and physical health remain our primary concern. In a 2017 interview with ESPN, Griner described feelings of isolation while playing in Russia. I mean, when you're stuck in it so much, you, you got to find a positive in it so you're not miserable. Now the U.S. is urging all American citizens to depart the country immediately, and the State Department has issued a do-not-travel advisory. Secretary of State Blinken was asked what the U.S. will do to help her. Uh, whenever an American is detained, anywhere in the world, uh, we of course stand ready to provide every possible assistance. Um, and that includes in Russia. Griner is now one of at least three Americans detained there. The others, Paul Whelan, the former U.S. Marine detained in 2018 and sentenced to 16 years in prison on an espionage charge he strongly denied. Former U.S. Marine Trevor Reed, currently serving nine years for assaulting a police officer, a crime he and his family denies happened and the U.S. ambassador to Russia said obviously didn't occur. As for Griner, it's unclear what role her detainment will play as global tensions rise. Vladimir Putin will try to use her to get something from the West. I don't think he will succeed because we don't generally bargain with the lives of American citizens. This, as Griner's loved ones await her safe return, her wife posting on Instagram, I love my wife wholeheartedly, so this message comes during one of the weakest moments of my life. Please honor our privacy as we continue to work on getting my wife home safely. Our thanks to James. And as he just mentioned, high tensions between Russia and the U.S. come at a dangerous time for another American, Trevor Reed, a 30-year-old former Marine who's been detained in Russia for two and a half years. Reed was detained by Russian police in the summer of 2019 following a drunken party in Moscow where he was visiting his girlfriend. Police initially said that they were taking him in to sober him up, but Reed was then questioned by Russian intelligence and soon after was charged with assaulting an officer. His family has called the charges trumped up and in recent weeks have been raising their concerns about their son's health. And we are joined tonight by Trevor's family, his mother Paula, his father Joey, and his sister Taylor, to the entire Reed family. We thank you so much for joining us. Paula, I'd like to start with you. You recently sent a new plea to President Biden and his wife Jill, saying in part, from one set of military parents to another, we need your help. Only you can save his life. Have you received any response? Uh, we actually have been asked 
support of a meeting with President Biden while he's going to be in Fort Worth tomorrow. And we got told this afternoon that they are not going to be able to accommodate us, so we will not have a meeting with him at all. And no response beyond that other than that you will not have a meeting. They haven't suggested that there is any ongoing conversation. No, they have not. And Joey, in your mind, has the United States done enough before these tensions escalated to, to try to bring Trevor home? They've, uh, well, first of all, they've spoken out about our son at all levels, including the president. We're very grateful for that. The uh, embassy and the ambassador are fantastic. Spiha's office is fantastic. But we believe at the highest levels of our government, there's been uh, negotiations that could have accomplished uh, a trade could have brought home, you know, Trevor and Paul uh, Whelan from Russia, but for some reason the administration has not made uh, those negotiations with the Russians like both President Trump and President Obama had done. And when we spoke last year, uh, when President Biden and Putin met for a summit, you would hope that Trevor's case and a potential prisoner swap would be a focus of the meeting, uh, but little happened. Uh, Paula, I'm curious, how concerned are you that, that this war and the deteriorating relations with Russia will only make Trevor's release that much more difficult? Well, we are very concerned, uh, not just because of the war, but because of the state of uh, physical uh, health that he's in right now. He is coughing up blood every day. He is having chest pain, I mean, lung pain, and he's having headaches. He's, he's just not doing well at all. And uh, he was uh, exposed to TB. So we're worried about him possibly having TB, but they refuse to test him and they are not giving him any kind of treatment. So that is our main focus right now. We're mostly concerned about his health. And obviously the war in Ukraine uh, makes it seem like there would be no negotiations to be able to go on. So we're, we're very, very concerned about his health. And so you just said that it seems like no more no negotiations would be able to go on. Have you heard one way or another if what the status is? Have they just kind of dropped that at this point because of the war? No, we've been told that communications are always left open. Even during the entire Cold War, uh, our countries were able to communicate. And uh, so uh, we have been told that obviously uh, those channels are going to be uh, minimized uh, over normal channels, uh, and that could uh, create some problems. But we still have hopes. Uh, the Russians are telling everyone, they have been for years, what they wanted. And uh, we think that some of that is possible. And we just uh, would wish that our government would do that quickly before the war gets out of hand or before our son dies of uh, some disease and lack of medical care. Taylor, when is the last time that you spoke to your brother and, and what did he have to say? Um, I actually got to speak with him this morning. Um, he called my parents on Friday for the first time in over 200 days. Um, I've happened to be here this morning when he called again. Uh, we touched base briefly on the state of things in the Ukraine and his health and a couple of other little things, but he sounds incredibly discouraged and very disheartened. Hardly sounds like my brother at all anymore. How difficult is it to, to communicate with him regularly? I know you said this is the first time he was able to call in more than 200 days. You know, 232 days to be precise. Uh, they would not let him call anyone but his girlfriend in Moscow and his Moscow attorneys. Um, and for some reason, in the past, in the, well, since Friday, they all of a sudden allowed him to call the embassy, who then forwarded his calls to us. And uh, two or three weeks ago, they started allowing him to be out of solitary confinement where he'd been essentially for most of the last seven months because he's refusing to work for his captors. Um, so there's been some uh, improvements in his treatment, uh, you know, uh, over the last few weeks uh, before the war even, and we're not sure why that's happening. We're happy that it is, but we don't know why. Taylor was just expressing how disheartened he sounded on the phone. What do you guys say to, to, to try to, to give him um, some kind of words of uplift or encouragement. Every time we get a chance to talk to him, we just remind him that we love him and we're here fighting for him and we're not gonna stop. And he usually tells us that we should stop trying and to just leave him there, but he's, we're not, we're not gonna stop until he's home with us. He feels his country's left him behind. Oh. If you all had a, a moment just to, to talk directly to President Biden, what would you say? We're desperate. He's the only man in the world that can bring our son home and possibly save his life. And our son's job 
that he volunteered extra time in the Marine Corps for and was proud of was to protect President Obama and Vice President Biden and their families, and he was willing to die for them. And we would just ask President Biden to honor that and, and bring this uh, good American home who is innocent of anything other than serving his country and his president. Paula, Joey, Taylor, Reed, we thank you so much for joining us during this time. Thank, thank you, you for having us on again. Still ahead, some much needed good news that we all need to hear in the fight against COVID. The Supreme Court weighs in on that decision to throw out Bill Cosby's conviction for sexual assault. Celebrating the storied careers of one of the greatest to ever coach a basketball game, we take a look at Mike Krzyzewski by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Lady Gaga announces her new summer concert dates. time anytime nightline it's an extraordinary story a computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence they let him turn himself into jail with no escort no one thought he would run how do you evade capture for 25 years how do you do that now join the search following the u.s marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt can you help catch this fugitive have you seen this man have you seen this man have you seen this man listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen She's in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. We love what we do. Aww. Times are tough, but healing animals actually helps heal the community. Thank you so much. Representation matters. Kids see us, and they say, I can do that. You want to be a veterinarian one day? Yeah. That is awesome. You ready to be a critter fix? What you think, bud? <laughs> Have you ever touched a cow? We get to do this as best friends. It don't get any better than that. We're healing with feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dr. Bernard Hodges. And I'm Dr. Terrence Ferguson. And, and we're, we're the Critter, critter Fixers. Fixers. Critter Fixers. New season Saturday, March 26th at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back, everyone. Legendary Duke coach Mike Krzyzewski, who is retiring at the end of this season, coached his final Duke home game this weekend in Durham, North Carolina. We take a look by the numbers. Nearly 42 years, that's how long Coach K has been prowling the sidelines as head coach of the Duke men's basketball team with his first home game way back in November of 1980. With 1,196 wins and counting, Coach K is the winningest coach in Division I men's basketball history 
and he's won five national titles and made 12 Final Four appearances with Duke in that span. With an official capacity of just over 9,300 seats at Cameron Indoor Stadium, tickets did not come cheap for Saturday's send-off. ESPN reported the cheapest tickets were listed at $3,450 days before the game. The best seats reportedly sold for his high as $50,000. Some 96 former Duke players lined the court to greet Coach K in a special pregame ceremony with the 75-year-old sharing fist bumps, chest taps, and hugs with his former players. Sadly for Duke fans, the team lost 94-81 to to in-state arch rival UNC. Coach K currently has a 50-47 to lifetime record against the Tar Heels and 10 that's the number of letters in Coach K's famously hard to pronounce last name, which is of Polish origin, and why so many people simply stick with Coach K. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. New questions surrounding the case of that California woman who made headlines for disappearing, but is now charged with faking it all. And so many compelled to help those Ukrainian refugees, the incredible outpouring of aid. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Choose ABC News, America's number one news source. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Okay, now, I love me some GMA so much. Time for me to do, well, a little GMA-ish promo. Ready? GMA 7A every day. Boom, boom, boom. Bring your friends. Yes. Now we're talking. That's how you start the day. With Robin, George, Michael, and GMA. Starting sharp at 7 a every day. So go on. Just say, Good morning, America. Good morning, America. You know it's America's number one morning show, people. Bring your friends. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon. 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Christopher Steele. The guy who picked a fight with two presidents. And he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. More than
than two years after the first coronavirus cases began to surface in America, more U.S. cities, states, and agencies are shifting their response to the pandemic. Today, New York City dropping its school mask mandate and vaccination requirement for businesses. New Jersey making masks optional in schools and daycares. I like that we still have the option to do it, and they're not just going to like take our kids' masks off. And even though the vaccine is authorized by the FDA for children ages 5 to 17 and strongly recommended by the CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics, Florida, now the first state in the country to officially advise against vaccinating healthy children for COVID-19. It's deeply disturbing that there are politicians peddling conspiracy theories out there. And though much of the country continues to loosen restrictions and mandates, a reminder that COVID is still a real threat as the worldwide death toll from the virus now crossing 6 million. A monster tornado caught on camera ripping through Iowa. Oh the National Weather Service confirms it was an EF4 tornado with winds of up to 170 miles per hour and a path of nearly 70 miles, destroying parts of Winterset just outside of Des Moines. This is, I think, the worst anyone has seen in uh, quite a long time. At least seven people killed, including a five and two year old from the same family. More than 50 homes damaged or destroyed. A spokesperson for Bill Cosby says the 84-year-old comedian is considering a final stand-up tour. This after the Supreme Court declined to revive the sex assault case against him. The U.S. Supreme Court declining to take up the case, rejecting a petition from prosecutors seeking to reinstate Cosby's 2018 conviction. Pennsylvania's highest court had ruled Cosby's due process rights had been violated. The actor-comedian left prison in June after serving three years. Accused of faking her own kidnapping, Sherry Papini is in jail. The 39-year-old detained, authorities calling her a danger and a flight risk ahead of her upcoming court appearance on Tuesday. A spokesperson for her family claiming she was ambushed in front of her two children when federal authorities arrested her at their Northern California home last week. A more than five-year investigation unraveling what authorities describe as an elaborate web of lies. Papini seemingly disappeared in November of 2016, reappearing three weeks later, badly injured, claiming she was abducted by two Hispanic women and physically and emotionally tortured, beaten and drugged. But investigators say they've discovered Papini harmed herself to support her false statements while staying with a former boyfriend. Papini is now facing up to 25 years in prison if convicted of charges for lying to federal agents and defrauding the state's Victim Compensation Board of $30,000, which paid for visits to her therapist for treatment for anxiety and PTSD according to the court filing. Authorities responded to a suspected migrant situation in the Florida Keys. The U.S. Coast Guard said a vessel came ashore near the Ocean Reef community in Key Largo on Sunday afternoon. Coast Guard crews and rescue workers responded quickly to help out about 350 Haitian migrants, which included women and children. Border Patrol said about 160 people tried swimming ashore. And this isn't the first time this has happened near Ocean Reef. In January, close to 100 people from Haiti made landfall nearby. Matt Reeves is the Batman beat expectations, opening with an estimated $128.5 million here in the States. The film, which marked Robert Pattinson's bow as the Dark Knight, also stars Zoe Kravitz and Colin Farrell. It's the fourth biggest opening for a Batman movie in North America. Internationally, the Batman earned $120 million, bringing its global total to $248.5 million. Next to the role cryptocurrencies may be playing in Russia's war against Ukraine, Ukraine is asking for new additional sanctions against Russia, including closing them off to cryptocurrency systems, which made us wonder about the role that emerging market has in this conflict. Our Deidre Bolton has more. As Visa and MasterCard suspend their services in Russia and sanctions placed on the economy take hold, many are turning to cryptocurrency. We're watching history being made in real time here. While other American tech companies and European ones are pushing to isolate Russia after its invasion of Ukraine, many are asking if Russian oligarchs could evade sanctions handed down. Crypto is traceable, it's transparent. If somebody's sending Putin Bitcoin from outside of Russia in order to evade U.S. sanctions, chances are they had to buy that Bitcoin at an exchange and that exchange has their name. While technically it could be used to evade sanctions, it's not a great way to do it. 
Previously, Iran and North Korea have used digital networks to limit the effects of sanctions, but most experts agree that Ukraine is receiving the bigger crypto benefit more than Russia is in a position to abuse it. On one hand, it's you know, the Ukrainian government is is raising war effort money. And then on the other hand, there's a lot of talk about Russia sort of using crypto to evade sanctions. One area where crypto's benefit is clear, raising money for humanitarian aid. Just this week, Ukraine's government says it received more than $42 million in donations. But what we are seeing is pledges of millions of dollars of cryptocurrency projects that have been Pledge to us. Save the Children has been accepting crypto donations since 2014, but the range is more varied now, accounting for the crypto world's expansion. What's fascinating about some of the emerging currency types are NFTs. We're getting inquiries from artists wanting to create an NFT, a non fungible token, to benefit Save the Children's response in Ukraine. As for the big picture takeaway, the significance of the moment stands out. You're crowdsourcing a humanitarian effort in real time, right? What an amazing use for this new technology of crypto. Our thanks to Deirdre for that. And finally tonight, stories of how American ingenuity and solidarity with Ukraine are coming together in a big way. Inspired by these images of Ukrainians displaced by the invasion of their country, Americans are finding inventive ways to help, even flooding Airbnb as a way to send aid. I booked the stay and then I immediately messaged the host and said, I just want to let you know I'm not going to be coming and staying. I just really wanted to find a way to to donate and, and make an impact. Alexa Goodell of Miami is one of many. According to a tweet Friday night from the CEO of Airbnb, in 48 hours, 61,406 nights have been booked in Ukraine. That's $1.9 million going to hosts in need. Nathaniel and Benjamin Mendoza from Minnesota wanted to help too. So the 12 and 10 year old brothers turned to their favorite pastime, basketball, to create a 10 day fundraising challenge. They call it Three Pointers for Ukraine, posting this on their mother's Facebook page. Please help us support kids from Ukraine who are looking for safety, home, and food in other countries. Our mom was born in Poland and we still have family there. Join our team. I know that there's a lot of bad things happening in the world right now, but there's also a lot of kindness. So far, their three-pointers have raised more than $12,000 from players around the world, including these four boys from an orphanage in Romania and these students from a school in Puerto Rico. Meanwhile, the Mendoza brothers are sharing their hoop dreams in the hopes of providing comfort and kindness to kids half a world away. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, this firefighter holding a baby who was one of the 1.7 million refugees of the war. This image was taken on the border of Romania and Ukraine. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. For the next hour, more on the war in Ukraine. We'll speak with a lawmaker trying to push the Biden administration to ban all Russian oil. And we're tracking those terrifyingly high gas prices. Pain at the pump. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. 
Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The war is sending gas prices in the United States soaring to all-time record highs. Gas Buddy reports that the national average of a gallon of gas is now $4.12. That breaks the record that was set back in 2008. The stock market also took a dive today. The Dow lost just under 800 points, nearly 2.5%. At least one teenager was killed in a shooting at a school in Des Moines, Iowa. Two others are in critical condition. Police say the shooting was outside of East High, but still on school grounds. There are suspects in custody. It's unclear if the victims are students at that school. The NFL has suspended Atlanta Falcons wide receiver Calvin Ridley through at least the 2022 season for betting on games. The NFL released a statement saying that Ridley gambled on games over a five-day stretch in November of last year when he was on the non-football injury list to address his mental health. Calvin said in a series of tweets that he bet $1,500 total, and he will be more healthy when he comes back. Now to the war in Ukraine. Tens of thousands of Ukrainians are fleeing in Ru as Russia continues to pound civilian targets. Meanwhile, efforts to establish a so-called humanitarian corridor for refugees to escape continues to fail. How Ukraine's president is now responding and a warning some might find the images disturbing. Here's ABC's Ian Panel with the latest. Tonight, across Ukraine, civilians are being driven from their homes by the tens of thousands. After efforts to establish temporary ceasefires were repeatedly broken by Russia, the Kremlin now claiming another one will come into force tomorrow in a number of cities. A previous corridor offered by Russia only allowing safe passage onto its own territory and that of its ally Belarus, which Ukraine calls unacceptable. So far, Russia's ceasefires set up for people to leave have been nothing of the sort. In Irpin, about 16 miles northwest of Kyiv, terrifying video shows civilians trying to escape when a mortar shell explodes. Soldiers bravely risking their own lives to give first aid. It was too late. At least eight people were killed, including at least three members of the same family. At least 5,000 people have fled, many of them under fire, having to run for their lives with what little they can carry after almost a week of intense fighting in the city. As the shells landed, trying to take cover, then having to navigate a blown-up bridge to run to safer ground. We're hearing the sound of fairly regular bombardment. We're close to the front lines. It's just down that road. The town of Irpin is being brutally shelled by Russian forces. Hundreds, thousands of civilians are desperately trying to get out of the town, but they've also come under fire. Some of them have been killed today, just trying to get out and get safe. Tatiana Bogatova is a pediatrician from the town. She had to run for miles through the night to escape with 18-month-old Vavara. The Russians were there in their tanks, she says. They fired mortar shells into people's yards. I couldn't stay there with a child. Across the country, Russia's stepping up its attacks, laying siege to some cities that are now cut off without power or heating. Ukraine's armed forces sharing a video of what they say is a downed Russian jet crashing. Meanwhile, a third round of ceasefire talks was held in Belarus today. Ukraine says small positive movements were made in trying to establish these humanitarian corridors.
The Kremlin claims that it could stop the attacks at any moment, but only if Ukraine promises to never join NATO, to recognize Crimea as Russian, and accept the independence of Russian-controlled parts of eastern Ukraine. All have been non-starters for Ukraine. President Biden talked with European leaders today who vowed to continue raising the costs on Russia amid discussions about possibly cutting off all Russian oil and gas imports. Also, the Pentagon revealing today it ordered an additional 500 U.S. troops to deploy to Europe over the weekend. We're joined now by Ian Panel in Kyiv. And Ian, I imagine there has been no indication you've seen that the temporary ceasefire Russia claims will begin tomorrow will be any different than failed attempts in the past few days? No, I think we're right to be sceptical, and that's certainly the view from the ground. I mean, don't forget that there was, uh, again, one of these temporary ceasefires, one of these uh, supposed humanitarian corridors established um, in Mariupol over the weekend. Almost immediately, the ceasefire was breached by Russian forces, and civilians came under attack. And here's the other problem with uh, the corridors that are now being proposed by Russia. They say there's going to be ceasefires um, on Tuesday morning here, is that they're saying that the passage, the safe passage, it doesn't lead into Ukraine uh, to the west, it doesn't lead towards Poland and Europe, it leads directly either into Russia or into Belarus, which of course is Russia's ally. So just imagine you, you're, you're leaving your home because you've been under bombardment, you're, you're running for your lives, and the Russians are expecting people to run into their arms. I mean, apart from the cynicism of that, the Ukrainian government saying that that is clearly unacceptable. And Adrian, you also had the chance to visit Irpin this weekend, one of those towns close to Kiev that has just been devastated. What struck you the most about what you saw there? Uh, you know what really shocked me the most is the last time I saw people look like that, look that scared, look that bedraggled, uh, people who'd, who'd gone to extraordinary lengths to just escape for their lives was in Mosul, in Iraq. Uh, when the battle was on to try and take the city from ISIS. And, and it was the same look in people's eyes, that sheer terror that they've literally been to hell and back. And, and even when they get out, they don't know where is safe, they don't know where they're going to go. Yeah, there was one uh, young mum, which is featured in our report, and she's a pediatrician in this town. Um, uh, you know, she has this 18-month-old toddler. And for anyone out there with kids, you know, you know how difficult it is just to keep toddlers uh, minded and safe inside your own home. She had to run through the night with a group of people passing a toddler from person to person through the night just to reach the edge of Irpin. Uh, and that's what so many people are going through right now. And for every person who gets out, there are many more who are left behind, unable to to get out now because they're surrounded by the fighting and of course they get caught in the crossfires what we see repeatedly in conflicts civilians always always paying the greatest price for something they didn't start and they can't control and often can't escape from right. Lindsay Ian panel reporting in from key for us once again thanks so much Ian and as this crisis escalates, the stream of humanity fleeing the war zone only continues to grow. Now 1.7 million people have left Ukraine for neighboring countries, some of them children orphaned due to this horror. Matt Gutman picks up that part of the story for us. Through those colorful gates, on the other side of that bomb shelter, the squeal of kids on a merry-go-round. But this isn't a school, it's a state-run orphanage. And half the children here have fled besieged cities in eastern Ukraine in desperate need of shelter, hot meals, and the nourishment of affection. They don't know what war is, we're told here, but they know that something is wrong. They know they're not where they used to be. Many kids, like the ones behind me, are from the war-torn region of Lugansk. Volunteers offer enrichment, coloring with them, building blocks, a few quiet minutes watching Paw Patrol. Even in Lviv, there are nightly reminders of the war. Every night when we hear the sirens, do they get terrified? She tells me it was horrible the first day the kids arrived. Every child was shouting and screaming. Their trauma expressed in flashes of anger and bursts of tears. I mean, this yes. seems like there's a lot of aggression. A lot of, a lot of aggression, anger. Yeah. yes, anger. Before the war, Anna was a political science major. These days, she specializes in the chemistry of cuddles. What do they need most? Just time spending, like being with them, is the most important. Our thanks to Matt Gutman.
We're joined now by ABC News Chief Global Affairs anchor Martha Raddatz. And Martha, we heard President Zelensky call again for a no-fly zone. Explain why the U.S. is rejecting that option and why it may not be as effective in countering Russia's current attacks. Well, you really have to think about what a no-fly zone is. A no-fly zone means that U.S. or NATO would not want Russian warplanes flying over areas of Ukraine. And if there was a Russian airplane, uh, they would be compelled to shoot it down. And that is what worries the U.S. and NATO, that it would enlarge the conflict and you would have direct conflict with Russia and NATO or Russia and the United States. And beside that, what's firing right now into those cities Cities, our, our shells, our, our missiles, our rockets, and a no-fly zone actually wouldn't do any good because they continue doing that from the ground. All right, Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you as always. And we are joined now by Congressman Kevin Brady of Texas, the top Republican on the House Ways and Means Committee. He's part of a bipartisan group that announced a deal today on legislation that would ban the import of oil and gas from Russia, and that would suspend normal trade relations with both Russia and Belarus. Congressman Brady, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I want to dive into the substance of this bill, but first, when can we expect a vote in the House? And do you have the support to, to also get this passed in the Senate? I know there's another Senate bill focused just on banning oil imports yeah so I think when we've we've uh, I don't know the timing I'm hopeful tomorrow uh, in the house certainly there is very strong bipartisan support I think this would be a veto proof majority in the house I'm hopeful the same in the Senate mainly because uh, Republicans and Democrats in both the House and Senate work through the weekend really constructively on this bill we think it it achieves what President Zelensky is pleading with America and the West to do, which is a full embargo on Russian energy uh, and the suspension of normal trade relations that will address the other imports from Russia into the United States and cut off more of that financing. So, you know, I think uh, it is a good bill. I don't think, I think we can do more, Lindsay, by the way, I think there needs to be secondary sanctions on banks and companies that are financing and buying Russian energy. I think there needs to be far more uh, openness to U.S. production of oil and natural gas. I, I, I'm frustrated. The president is uh, begging Venezuela and Iran for energy when we have the cleanest energy right here in the U.S. And you said in your statement announcing this agreement that it will, quote, send a clear message to Putin that his war is unacceptable. But as you know, Vladimir Putin has pushed ahead despite sanctions that have tanked his country's economy already. Why do you feel that this measure in particular on energy imports would do anything to change his behavior? Yes, so there's no question. Uh, um, sanctions alone won't stop the bullets or the tanks uh, done right and with our partners they can impose a significant economic harm on Russia and certainly undermine Russian people's support for this war. So it could help hasten the end of it quicker, but there's no question you need lethal aid uh, for Ukraine. The president's been very, President Zelensky has been very clear about that. Plus, I do think we need to do more in the sanctions area, certainly in energy that could deepen the pain and, and increase the consequences to Russia for their aggression. And there are reports today that the U.S. is considering easing sanctions on Venezuelan oil to make up for lost imports from Russia, as you just said, with gas, though, now over $4 a gallon. What do you say to critics who say that this all is proof that, that we should put more resources into quickly moving the sources of clean energy and technology like electric vehicles instead of oil from overseas or, or calling for more domestic energy production? So renewables themselves will have no impact. It'll be years and years and years and decades before it is in a uh, position to play that role. Nonetheless, just the approval of Keystone Pipeline uh, would have uh, moved more uh, oil from Canada to the U.S. this year than that we buy from Russia. And there are other uh, actions we could take to become more domestically strong and to increase our exports around the world significantly to help our partners as well. Uh, so look, renewables won't do the trick, but uh, more American-made energy rather than um, begging com countries that uh, support terrorism and uh, 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 sort of thug nations, frankly, isn't, I think, the solution that Joe Biden's proposing isn't what the American people want to see. 
And as you know, Europe is far more reliant on energy supplies from Russia than the U.S. Do you think that our European allies are prepared to take a similar step to ban Russian energy imports? And potentially, could this backfire if it hurts the global economy more than it hurts Russia? Yeah, so I'm, uh, look, I think we all recognize Europe has uh, put themselves in a pickle here, reliant on R Russian energy. America, I think, is both cognizant of that. And again, I think the pr President Biden has the ability to make America a far more dependable and larger partner with Europe as they wean themselves off. So no question, it is more difficult. But for, for example, the UK uh, could join us here, I think, in a significant way on banning uh, Russian energy. Canada has already moved this direction. I think it's important for the allies to do that, especially as we saw Shell make the decision uh, this weekend to buy about 100,000 metric uh, tons uh, of, uh, of energy from Russia. I think it's really important to the degree we can to act together. But nonetheless, America can lead further in this area. Congressman Kevin Brader, we Brady, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Lindsay. And still to come, the deadly soccer brawl. Fans in the stands attacking each other. And our conversation with superstar Kelly Rowland, who is out with a new initiative to help children. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva, drama, money and fame, shop amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Hong Kong is struggling to contain a COVID-19 outbreak with mass isolation facilities and makeshift morgues as they report more than 25,000 new infections. COVID has torn through hundreds of nursing homes and hit many of the city's unvaccinated elderly. The deluge of cases has swamped Hong Kong hospitals, isolation centers, and funeral homes beyond capacity and left the healthcare system struggling with limited staff. Dozens were injured, some even killed after a shock 
shocking brawl broke out during a soccer match in Mexico on Saturday. During the middle of the game, people rushed the field after fans in the stands starting attacking each other by throwing punches, trash cans, and anything they could find at each other. The violence led to Mexico suspending the remainder of the league soccer matches for the weekend. Moderna has picked Kenya as the location for its first mRNA vaccine factory in Africa. The move is welcome news for the Kenyan president, who said the entire continent was left behind in the early stages of the pandemic, quote, not because of want, but because of lack. He hopes Moderna, with their $500 million investment, will fill that space. Do you remember the first time you saw a superhero who looked like you on your screen? Well, for some in the Latino community, that memory may be a rare one. According to a prominent Marvel and DC graphic novelist, out of their 30,000 characters, roughly 3% are Latino. Now a Mexican-American comedian and his team of Latino writers are trying to change that narrative. Al Madrigal, renowned comedian, writer, and actor, is now out with a new comic series titled Primos, which is Spanish for cousins and tells the story of three distant cousins bound by their ancient Mayan lineage. The three are called on as Earth's last hope to save the world. Al, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's um, it's exciting to uh, have this uh, be out there and uh, to talk about it. I'm excited to take a look at Primos. Now, this is heavily focused on characters of Mexican heritage. Walk us through the, the creative process behind writing Primos and, and why bringing these three cousins together was so important. Well, I actually met the editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics when I first started at The Daily Show. His name was Axel Alonzo, and uh, we met at a comic book podcast, and we both realized that we had everything in common, and we gravitated towards characters that looked like us. So it was at mostly African-American superheroes, um, and decided to do something about it when he became the editor-in-chief and founder of a new company called AWA. So we created, uh, there's Ricky right there fighting this huge Mayan Sicario. Um, and we created these three characters that are tasked with protecting the world. This kid, Ricky, is a 16-year-old, you know, LA kid who just, you know, got wasted at a party and finds his great, 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 great uncle standing in his living room telling him he's the most powerful sorcerer in the universe. And what's really cool about this as well is that, that readers can also learn Spanish from this comic book. Why was that important for you to incorporate uh, some words in Spanish? Well, we actually released um, a Spanish edition and uh, with very, you know, Mexican Spanish, um, because again, you know, people tend to lump Latinos together and Mexican Americans are 64 and a half percent of the Latino population in the United States. Uh, so we, I just feel like, again, underrepresented even amongst Latinos, that 3% number I hadn't heard before is just shocking. 20% of the population, 3% of the comic book characters, 5% of the characters on TV and film. So um, it's really important that people see themselves and hear themselves. Clearly a, a disconnect in those numbers. And separately, you also wrote a fully Spanish language version of your book. It, did you find that process to be challenging or that, or that was easy? Well, that's uh, me calling in favors from a couple of uh, Mexican friends uh, to make sure that it was authentic Mexican Spanish. You just want to make sure that it's, uh, it's, it's very specifically like a Mexican story. And you talked about the, the disparity, but, but just want to go one step further with that, because as of 2020, Latinos make up more than 62 million uh, Americans here, and yet they're very overlooked in the, in the comic world. Why do you think that that's been the case? It's just, I think it's the same as a lot of things where you have the origin for a lot of these characters. You know, look at Marvel and, you know, DC and, and Stan Lee, where they're creating the, the characters were created, you know, during the 50s and 60s when, you know, it was mostly, uh, mostly white males. And so, uh, like anything else, you know, it's just uh, taken a little too long for... The characters we see, you know, reflect the current state of the population. So, um, uh, I, you know, I'd hate to, I, I just can't believe it took me to do this. <laughs> 
And and another funny scenario that I've I've heard uh, several comedians talk about is how difficult it is to tell your parents that you want it. you're going to grow up and be a comedian. And, and you end your book with a personal letter where you describe how difficult it was to to tell your parents that that that's what you were going to do for a living is tell jokes. Tell us about your partnership with George Lopez and and how you're trying to change the stigma around becoming something other than well, a doctor or engineer. You, when I when I got, I told my dad I was going to be here as a stand-up comedian, I got yelled at. <laughs> it, it was, uh, are you crazy? Do you know how much the gas costs to drive there? <laughs> and so um, this was not a real job. So what I'm doing at my high school, St. Ignatius College Preparatory in San Francisco, is for the last couple years, I think it's six years running now, um, I've done the Mario Prieto Comedy Award. And that goes to $2,500 to a junior going into their senior year who's just funny. No uh, grades necessary, just goes to the funniest junior. And then um, I were doing a George Lopez scholarship in the Southern California area where just $250 goes to a class clown. Just so the parents can see being funny pays and they should entertain you know, careers in the entertainment business because, you know, we don't have the uncles and um, grandfathers and dads that are, have been working in the entertainment industry for years. So I just want parents and relatives to see that uh, be there are creative jobs out there and, and being funny. Um, you shouldn't, you know, villainize the kid and uh, make him get a regular job if he's hilarious. I was a class clown. If only we had had this opportunity back then. <laughs> so you really were? You did. I, I, I was. I don't know how many people look, think I'm funny now. I think I'm funny, but Al Madrigal. It worked out. Look what happened. It yeah. worked out. It yeah. all works out in the end. Yeah. Al Madrigal, we thank you so much. The second edition of Primos comes out March 9th, wherever books are sold. And still to come, Kelly Rowland gives back. Stay with us. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. The Disney Dreamers Academy, which helps students make their career dreams come true by matching them with industry leaders, is back this year. And as expected, the 2022 class had lofty goals and the celebrity speakers offered their advice to help this inspirational group achieve their dreams. Our Janae Norman got a chance to attend the Academy and sat down with the talented Kelly Rowland. <laughs> It's a magical place where dreams take flight. Show some love to the class of Disney Dreamers Academy 2022! Disney Dreamers Academy celebrating 15 years strong. 100 exceptional high school students from underrepresented communities come together for four transformative days full of mentorship, those action gestures, networking, and Disney fun. Aspiring filmmaker Kaylee Joy Cooper leads her own nonprofit. It was an honor to meet with professional filmmakers that even have their own production company um, because that's something that I want to do and I want to be like them. Michael Wren is a young entrepreneur. They've taught us many things that 
um, just honestly changed the way I think. And Makai Haywood dreams of becoming a musical artist. At first walking in, it's like, okay, these are big people. I'm scared to go up to them. But then I realized, like, they're here to help us. We're here to network. So just to go for it. This year's ambassador, Grammy Award-winning singer-songwriter, and self-proclaimed lifelong dreamer herself, Kelly Rowland. You consider yourself a lifelong dreamer. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that that's what was so awesome. It seems like even though you're speaking to these kids, there's something that's bouncing from them coming back to you, just reminding you to dream. What messages did you share with them about how to pursue those dreams? Just the fact that they have these huge dreams and they're so young and they can already see such amazing things for themselves. We need them. We need them to change the world. And that resilience, the getting back up, yeah. no matter how many times you fail, as long as you get back up at least yes. one more time, you're yes. good. Where do you find the strength? I had to talk to myself. Sometimes you have to be your biggest fan. And the truth is that sometimes I, it's so crazy because you're your biggest opponent and you can be your biggest fan at the same time. Mm -hmm. You have to really like talk yourself through everything. And I think that for me, like even in the times where I was like, oh, you sure you, you ready for this? Of course you're ready for mm -hmm. this. You have to be the person that does <laughs> you're that too. Person. You can do and it. And there's nothing wrong with that. And if you feel like it's just like off a little in the moment and it doesn't feel authentic, it will. It will, because sometimes you have to fake it till you make it. And when you do make it, you can be able to say, I, I got myself through that. How do you still, after realizing, I'm yeah. sure so many of your dreams, how do you still dream and find the inspiration to go after those dreams? Oh, because my ideas are just endless. I'm, I'm, I consider myself very much so a creative person, but I also know I have two young minds watching me. I want them to carve out their own space too. So I just feel like I have their pressure. They definitely keep me on my toes and as, as far as next projects and ideas are concerned. And I have so many. Still dreaming our thanks to Janae for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Tonight, the ABC News exclusive, my interview with Ukraine's President Zelensky. The situation in Kyiv right now, the Russians with their sights on several major cities. The images tonight, civilians under attack. President Zelensky's phone call with President Biden and what Zelensky says he needs right now. The interview comes amid the horrific images of civilians being shelled northwest of Kyiv. They were trying to escape an attack to race to safety. 
at least eight people killed. Russia ramping up attacks on civilians. We ask President Zelensky what he would say to Vladimir Putin right now. As President Zelensky pleads for that no-fly zone over Ukraine with help from the U.S. and NATO allies. He's also asking for help with Soviet-era fighter jets in Poland and why he believes the U.S. can help on this front. Families by the thousands trying to flee under heavy fire, the chilling picture of men, women, and children taking cover under a bridge. The Pentagon believes nearly all Russian troops staged along Ukraine's borders are now inside Ukraine. Tonight, President Zelensky, we ask how long can they hold back the Russians? And his message in English tonight for the American people. Ian Panel in Kyiv in my interview with President Zelensky. And tonight, amid these new pleas for help from President Zelensky, the White House now responding. Cecilia Vega asking about those fighter jets. She's at the White House. And Martha Raddatz tonight and what her sources are telling her. Why Zelensky likely wants those fighter jets right now. What they're seeing on the ground. More than 1.7 million refugees now escaping Ukraine, including up to 800,000 children. Matt Gutman in Ukraine tonight with the extraordinary story of the orphans. Here at home, the deadly school shooting at a high school in Des Moines, what we've learned. We're also tracking severe storms tonight from Alabama all the way up into the Northeast. Damaging winds from Atlanta to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia to New York. And the deadly tornado in Iowa, they now believe it was an EF4, winds up to 170 miles per hour. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening. It is great to start a new week with all of you at home. And we begin tonight with the ABC News exclusive, our interview with President Zelensky of Ukraine. His plea for help tonight from the U.S. and NATO, what he says he needs most right now. And it comes amid a worsening scene across much of Ukraine these last 24 hours. Civilians coming under attack while trying to flee to safety. President Zelensky saying Kyiv and other cities are being bombarded. Tonight, those civilians under fire as they flee the violence. And we warn you, these images are difficult. A mortar shell exploding along the escape route from the city of Irpin at 16 miles north.